So here we are at the 390th Bomb Group Memorial Museum and we're chatting to Keith who has, to be fair, the best job in the building because he is in charge of all the artifacts and especially the jackets. So Keith, let's start with you. What brought you to the museum here? What's your journey into curation? So I got into this position. It really started off as an internship five years ago <laughs> through the University of Arizona. And, and they would never let you leave. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> they locked me up. <laughs> they put the ball and chain on my foot. I've yeah. never been allowed to leave since. <laughs> Sorry, continue. Yes. So it started off with an internship five years ago mm -hmm. with the Archives and Collections Department, and then it kind of segued from there. So mm -hmm. I went from being the intern to being a member of the team. So I got hired. So I was hired onto a full time, to a part time position, and then just worked up the ranks to where I am right now. Mm -hmm. So the, the museum's got such a great story. Last time I was here, I had a long chat with Bill about mm -hmm. the history of it and the fabulous things that the, the members of the 390th have donated to the museum. Mm -hmm. You see all these things coming in. I, we're clearly going to be talking about the jackets because those are the, some of the eye-catching ones. But what are some of the other things that the museum has in its collection that have been donated? Uh, we've seen quite a few things come through our doors. Mm -hmm. So we've seen medals, we've seen... Um, Manuals for B-17s, gunnery manuals, mm -hmm. uh, maintenance manuals. Um, we've seen a couple of German artifacts come through here. Um, we've seen patches. We've seen other jackets, not the A2 jackets, more like uniform jackets. Mm -hmm. We've seen the Eisenhower ones that kind of end at the waist there, yeah. the ones that go further down there. Um, we've gotten, we have caps. We've, we've got visor caps. We've got quite a, quite a collection here. Mm. It, it's fantastic. And these artifacts here in the cases, the, the A2s, mm -hmm. First time I saw them, it sort of struck me because I just walked down the, the photos and then you turn around and you see the jackets and you realize that I couldn't fit in one of those, which just reminds me that these chaps were not me. Oh yeah, these, yeah. Were, these were pretty young guys and they were pretty small guys, yeah. especially if you were going to be put in the ball turret. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so how many A2s have you got in the collection so far? So we have a little over 40 jackets in our collection mm -hmm. right now. And are all of them personalized or is uh, it to some varying degrees? There are varying degrees of personalization. So the set right now, you're going to see a lot of similar imagery. So you'll see the symbol of the 8th Air Force, like this one right here, a lot of B-17s. Mm -hmm. So there's those very similar images you see that kind of just show how deeply ingrained these things came to be for the airmen that served in the 8th mm -hmm. Air Force and with the B-17 in particular. Yeah. But that doesn't mean there wasn't room for some personalization in there. I mean, we've got people that... Um, there was a jack my favorite jacket in the collection is actually called Uninvited Missionaries, <laughs> and it literally shows uh, a friar holding a bomb about to throw it. So you got things like that. Small yeah. bits of humor. Yeah. Even with the naming of some things, like Uninvited Missionaries, it's not spelled how, it, how you would expect it, right? Because Missionaries, it ends with uh, A-R-I-E-S, right? Yeah. In this case, it's A-I-R-E-S, so kind of a play on words there. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Because, you know, the... The jackets became synonymous, didn't they? And you know, famously, you have um, the, the poor guy who put murder ink on the back of his and then got captured. And mm -hmm. the Germans made a field day of that. But mm -hmm. the little bits of personal touches to show, to show who the kid was who was in this. And I say kid because uh, they would be half my age mm -hmm. at, at that. What about this jacket here, Shuttle Babe? What, what's, what's the tale behind it? So Shuttle Babe is actually a reference to uh, a shuttle mission. Mm -hmm. So. It wasn't going back to England after his mission. It was flying off to its target, and then it was going to actually land at an airfield in Soviet in the Soviet, in the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. right? So that was what it was called, the shuttle mission. Yep. So you go to this Allied airfield up here, refuel, and then you go back. In this case, this person who wore it, his name was uh, Sergeant Calvin E. McCart. He was involved in a supply drop to Warsaw during the Warsaw Uprising of oh, 1944. Right. And so from there, dropped his supplies in uh, Warsaw, and then carried on to, to the Soviet Union. The drops to the, the Warsaw Uprising is always one of those things that some people say should have been, you know, hindsight ruling, should have been more drops, should have been less, and mm -hmm. it just ended so terribly. But Well, there was also a lot of politics involved oh, yeah, in there. I mean, yeah. you had the Western Allies that wanted to support the Polish, and then you had Stalin who was like, I don't want you giving weapons <laughs> to the people I want to subjugate when I get in. <laughs> Let's move, move on to, to the next case. Okay. What goes into keeping these jackets in such con good condition? Because you know, the colors on them are fantastic. And, you know, these, are, mm -hmm. these are working items that they would have been chucking around and flying in and things like that. 
how do you preserve these things? These things are several. How do you preserve the, the jackets for you know, those of us who wander into the museum to see? So one of the first things we do in terms of preservation is just set up a system of rotation. So what mm -hmm. that means is that we give these guys a rest period between times that we put them out on display. Mm -hmm. These guys will be out on display for like four months and then we'll put them back into storage. And storage is also a critical factor here. Mm -hmm. So you want to put these lying flat in a box. You don't okay. want them to be like hung up in a coat, like with a coat hanger mm -hmm. inside your closet because gravity is going to start pulling things down yeah. and it's going to cause some damage long term. You want that storage box to have a nice seal to it because you don't want dust or bugs getting mm -hmm. in that jacket because some bugs do eat like cloth and leather, yeah. like moth damage. You probably know mm -hmm. about that. I'm imagining everybody knows about that. Yes. <laughs> we, we, we know about moths very well in my part of England. They, um, yeah, let's not get started on that. Yeah. Lots of carpets are a family of moths. Oh dear. Yeah, so there we go. Sorry, yeah, so it's, it's, it's keeping them flat, keeping them dry, keeping them dust free. Yeah, flat and, and dry. Yeah. Especially since uh, you also want a consistent humidity with these mm -hmm. guys because leather is just treated skin, so, mm -hmm. and it's porous. So it's going to expand and retract in the presence or absence of moisture. Mm -hmm. So if there's that fluctuation, obviously you're gonna have that expanding and the retracting going on. And if the leather is getting too dry, that's gonna cause some cracking in it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I guess it'll probably crack right underneath the artwork on the jackets. Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, and that's another thing, is if you have that nice consistent humidity, if the paint gets too dry, it's gonna start flaking, yeah. cracking. And that goes also back to the discussion about the boxes, which is you want it to be lined with like, you wanna give that box some nice padding so that thing doesn't like shift around. And ideally you want, you're gonna to wanna to use acid-free tissue paper. Mm -hmm. And I cannot stress enough that you wanna use acid-free tissue paper because regular paper obviously has been treated with acids yep. and the wood pulp itself. There are things inside that wood pulp that actually encourage the creation of more acids. So that's why paper turns yellow and brittle over time. Mm -hmm. So, and that acid can be introduced to other artifacts that it's stored so, with. Yeah, so that the, the, the contact transfer from it will then affect whatever artifact you have in the box. Exactly. Yeah. So, if we start heading over here, the, the Joker one. Yes. Which is a terrible way to describe it. It's just the one that sticks, in, sticks into my head. Oh no, that's perfectly fine. That's actually the, uh, that was actually the nickname of this squadron was Jokers in the Hole. Mm -hmm. So, throughout all the collection, do you see similar imagery Again and again, because there's the, so you said the eight Air Force One, mm -hmm. we sort of see it in variations pop up. Would that because, maybe be because the, the artist that was painting the jackets would just be, you know, doing the same thing for different guys coming in for whatever they were trading for the, the paintwork? Uh, it really came down to personal preference. Yeah. I mean, in this case, it wasn't really up for discussion. That was like the unit emblem yeah. and pretty much all, pretty much most, if not all these jackets are gonna find that unit emblem right there. Mm -hmm. um, there is a little bit of personalization in there. Some of these jack, some of those emblems were embroidered. Others were just painted onto like a piece of leather, like with yeah. this guy here, or even just painted directly onto the jacket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've got a mix of how it's doing. Like you're saying, you could get a bit of leather, mm -hmm. paint it on, sew it on, or mm -hmm. as these ones, just straight onto the jacket. Do you know what sort of paints they were using? Um, That's putting you right on the spot. So we can, I don't have the answer to that. But well, well, the people who painted it, it really kind of depended. You could have somebody on the crew who was artistic or somebody else you knew was mm -hmm. artistic or a local artist in the lo in their nearby village. Yep. With the guys on base, it was a matter of, how do you pay these guys? Cigarettes are just favors, things like yeah. that. So the last jacket in the case, mm -hmm. you, you have there for a specific reason, don't you? Yes. Yeah, so this one right here, you'll notice is completely blank. There's no unit emblems, no art on the back. This is the one we call the blank slate. And this one is really kind of meant to be a tribute for the guys that didn't make it home after the war, the guys who were shot down. Yep. And it's, I think it's really fitting. I, 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 really, I really like that in there. Is, of course, let's ask the geeky question. Is it a new jacket or is it a jacket of, of the period? Oh, it's a jacket of the period. Actually, so, that's the thing. A lot of jackets, in fact, the majority of A2 jackets were not actually decorated. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, when, when we see sort of film and TV shows of everybody having painted jackets or painted things, that wasn't standard. So that wasn't really like, you weren't gonna find everybody with a painted jacket on them. Mm -hmm. You'll find a unit patch and obviously you'll find an ID yeah. tag on them, but by and large, a lot of jackets were not decorated. And even some that were decorated, it was, sometimes the decoration could be really small. Like one jacket in our collection, it's literally just Hellcats, tiny lettering, yellow paint on the back, <laughs> that's it. So 
it's, it's just that dash of, you know, I'm an individual yeah. in, a, in a great big machine. Yeah, there's mm. a lot of individuality in it. And even with some common symbols you see, like bombs or things mm -hmm. like that, that, I, that say how many missions you flew, there are different ways in which people organize them. Mm -hmm. Like the, uh, the shuttle babe over there had the, um, had the bombs on the sleeves, mm -hmm. while as others have it in the back, and sometimes they'll have it in one row, sometimes they'll have it in several yeah. rows. So you got the, on, um, on, this, on this one here, the bag end, you've got straight and curves, so the guy's yeah. re really filling it all in, so it's yeah, so there's a lot of personal preference. Yeah, and actually, if you look at this picture over here on the wall, you can actually see, even with different crews, there were different ways in which they organized their stuff. So with these swastikas over here, which likely meant fighters shot down, this guy has them um, vertically, and this guy over here has them horizontally. Mm -hmm. So different ways of organization. So same crew, but stamping, their, but adding their own individuality to it. Yeah. So again, s similar styles of artwork, but then you're not going to be, yeah, each one's individual, each one's being painted to order and probably not not been given a lot of time to get the artwork on the back of the jacket. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, getting these jackets was kind of a, was a status symbol for these guys. I mean, mm -hmm. we have a couple of jackets where we see um, flecks of paint on like other areas and it's like directly opposite of stuff. And, it, and our theory is this guy was so enthusiastic to put it on, he didn't actually give it enough, the paint enough time to dry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. So these are sort of the, the prominent ones. The, the things that don't tend to get out on display but are equally sort of you find passionate what, what are some of those smaller items um let's say well metals do carry a lot of weight to them if you know what they mean like yeah. um with the air metal in the eighth air force so just some backstory during world war ii the awarding of like the distinguished flying cross of the air force or the air medal was kind of a uh, it varied between different commands mm -hmm. in the eighth air force you got the air medal if you finished five bombing missions okay like you finish five bombing missions you get an air medal you finish 25 you get a distinguished flying cross so things like that it's kind of like a sign that you survived that yes. long which as most of your guys are going to know was a pretty pretty tall task mm -hmm. at, especially early in the war yeah um or the, um, we do have several um, Purple Hearts, which some of your viewers will know is uh, what was awarded for people who were wounded or killed in action. And we have one from a gentleman who was killed in action on his 13th mission, and he was 21 at the time. Mm. So. It's the youth, isn't it? That, yeah. You know, we, it's a terrible thing to say, but you see reenactors today who are gentlemen of, of, of my stature and belly who don't always represent a 21 year old kid who's mm -hmm. first time out of the country most likely yeah and you end up in yeah east anglia of all places yeah poor, poor guys if you've ever been it's it's a special part of the world i have friends from there so i will be getting text messages saying you shouldn't have said that oh, you leave it <laughs> in. Um, and it's you know it's a grand adventure but at the same time to a quite terrifying reality yes yeah, yeah. it was definitely a daunting time we also have some pretty interesting things in our collection, which when I first found them, I was just like, where did this come from? Uh, case in point, there is actually a, um, a stick in the collection, just a, a stick from a tree or something like that. The story behind that is that when this plane came home and he had the ground crew working on it, one of the ground crewmen like, found, noticed something inside the engine and pulled out this stick. This plane had actually been flying so low to the ground that it just started ripping things up from like the trees it flew over. And so that's how it got jammed in there. <laughs> that's brilliant. And again, just linking back to the story and the reality of, of, of what was going on. So when, when we think of you know, museums, sometimes something that someone would think mundane, you know, a jacket, a jacket and a medal not being mundane, but the, the smaller sort of inferior as well, that mm -hmm. everyday life, random stick, adds to the story of what this museum's trying to do. Exactly. And a lot of what we try to do with these artifacts is present the story behind them because mm -hmm. that's where the power comes in. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you look at the stick or you look at this metal and if you don't have that context, it's not going to mean anything to you. But if you give it that human touch, if you give it that story to it, then you develop that connection between the past and the person looking at this artifact. That's how you grab people. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Keith, thank you so much for letting us drag you away from your desk for a few minutes and bring you up here. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yep, my pleasure. 
To find out more about the 390th Memorial Museum at the Pima Air and Space Museum, do check out their website at 390th.org and find out about the upcoming 390th Bomb Group Gathering at Grissom Air Museum in July. Details are to come, so be sure to follow the 390th on all their social media pages. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.